the institutionalists seem to be closer to the neoclassical tradition with regard to the premises that they have with like the theoretical foundations, um, just seeing exceptions to it, um, and um, very opposed to, to Marxism as, as, a, right. as a different, um, generally different approach to political economy. But when it comes to political, con uh, to politics, it seems that the Keynesian um, politics are much closer or are much more opposed to neoclassical um, policy proposals um, and are much closer to Marxism, especially if you think of um, Yanis Varoufakis, for instance, who calls yeah. himself an erratic Marxist. He said yeah. at the beginning of the crisis, well, at the moment, there is no Marxist uh, economic policy to turn things around in Greece or to alleviate the humanitarian catastrophe, um, but there's only Keynesian uh, solutions. Um, would you agree with that statement? Um, no, I don't. I, I know Yanis well. and I. Um, I think that when he said he was an erratic Marxist, he's really describing the Marxist tradition itself, right? Which has been fractured and very erratic, focused, fixated on individual problems, transformation problem. Everybody's written something about the transformation problem. Everybody's got about the theory of value. But how many Marxists have written about the theory of exchange rates, which is a central issue now, or about the theory of productivity, or the theory of interest rates, or the theory of capital flows? Not just the description, but the theoretical foundations of that. They're quite few, and often they focus on one thing. So he's right to be an erratic Marxist because there isn't anything in the Marxist tradition that would provide a systematic framework. And that's one of the things that motivated me all along was to say that we cannot just ad hoc invent for every problem a solution without recognizing that that may contradict something else. We have to have a framework that is systematic. And this is where the neoclassicals are ahead of everyone else. Well, however they do it, they have a point of departure, a fictitious one, but one where they uh, begin from and measure their uh, outcomes and their departures from. Keynesians don't have that. At, for the level of this kind of detail. They have the idea of effective demand, but when you come to the microeconomics and the theory of prices and all that, they don't have anything the, uh, systematic. post Keynesians have something systematic, which is monopoly all the way through, but then, in my opinion, it's tied exactly to the neoclassical story by inversion. They mm -hmm. say competition, we say monopoly, and I think that's a trap. So again, part of what I try to do is show that there is a way to explain the phenomena that post Keynesians talk about. So when someone like Varfakis says, well, he's an erratic Marxist, he's I think it's making a true statement about where the Marxist tradition is, which is that it had devolved into a series of, of uh, partial inquiries and partial answers, which and actually you can't add together uh, in any systematic way. And I think that there is a virtue to uh, having a framework that is grounded in actually what Smith, Ricardo, and Marx were arguing about and talking about and can encompass Keynes and Kletsky in a systematic way without there being any sort of new stages of capitalism or departures from the foundations uh, and so that's what I tried to do, and it took a long time um, because I had to do the empirical work also. I had to do not only the theory, but the empirical work. But if it's true, then we have answers to the kinds of questions we were talking about. For instance, what can you do in Greece? You can certainly do something in Greece. You can do a lot in Greece. Within capitalism, you can't just do anything. And so that's where the understanding of how capitalism operates comes into direct play. We have to know the limits and, on the other hand, the flexibility of the system. It's not infinitely flexible, but it's not a rigid system. Uh, we have to know how the limits begin to assert themselves when we approach them and be prepared for that. And um, I mean, isn't it also, do you think it would be something that uh, the Marxist oriented left should strive for to develop policy proposals because in the end so much depends on politics itself? Like. Um, um, that it depends on, you know, for instance, with Greece, it was um, a government was elected from the left that said we can stay within the eurozone, but at the same time break with austerity. And those two demands were politically incompatible because of um, the makeup of the European Union and the relationships of forces within the European Union. So it was something that had to be learned. Like there was no way, as La Pavitsas would have wanted, that there was a, a Lexit, like um, a Brexit from the left, um, um, because the, the Greek population was not prepared for. Um, you know, like um, like a sudden devaluation of the drachma and then um, like sudden, like a deterioration of the humanitarian crisis because of medication would have been more expensive, food right. would have been more expensive to be imported. Right. So like it, it's, it seems that it's difficult from a, a Marxist perspective to even try and find um, solutions to well, some I, of those questions. Well, I, I would say it's difficult in part because we don't have much of a systematic understanding of these concrete phenomena and these concrete reactions. What happens when you have a devaluation? We draw on some empirical stuff, some practical stuff, some Keynesian stuff, some neoclassical stuff, mm -hmm. and we come up with an understanding. In my opinion, that's not an adequate way to proceed. Maybe you have no choice at the moment, but it's not an adequate way to proceed. The other side of that, if you do have a framework, then you can prepare for the actual outcomes. If the framework is adequate and is able to understand what, what you're going to get, then if you want to venture that path, you have a better preparation uh, and also better possibilities of the, of the twists and turns in that path. Now, I understand that politics can often be decisive in these things. You may not be able to do what you want to do, 
But we also know that many times when the left has had an opportunity to have an influence on, on uh, practical things, uh, it led to problems that the left itself didn't understand. I mean, one of the points I make in my book, for instance, that the original practical left was the Keynesian left. Uh, because they came in saying, look, we have the Great Depression. Capitalism has squandered the opportunity to do something about it because it doesn't even understand the theoretical issue involved. And Keynes says, let me show you how it can be addressed. And little by little, governments pick up on the idea that the state becomes the regulator in the last instance of capitalism, on the banking system, on employment. But the key proposition of Keynesian economics, which is that employment is uh, uh, elastic and unemployment is elastic, and I can make it disappear by just pumping up the system without any consequences until I reach full employment, then maybe I have inflation. That was the Phillips curve. Mm -hmm. That turned out to be false. It turned out that the Phillips curve didn't exist. It fell apart within five or seven years of its practical application. But the question was still there. What happens when you pump up a system? And I tried to show in the book that what happened was what you would have expected and could have expected if you had an understanding of the impact of effective demand on profitability. And the point is a simple one. If I pump up the system and reduce unemployment, then as Marx long ago pointed out in the discussion of the Reserve Army of Labor, if you reduce unemployment, you're going to raise wages relative to whatever their trend is relative to productivity. So you're going to raise the rate of surplus value. Other things being equal, it lowers the profit rate. So it puts a downward pressure on the profit rate, and that is the limit. Because with the profit rate, if the profit rate begins to go down, then growth slows down, and the unemployment comes back up. Well, that's exactly that's the story of the reserve. We've had it all along. Yeah, we just never use it because we do these things ad hoc. And so we put these things together. Then a picture emerges that helps explain why Keynesian theory was knocked off the pedestal also by its uh, failure to explain inflation coming back and unemployment coming back at the same time. But that's something that can be explained. If it can be explained, then hopefully we can at least deal with the options as they appear and accept them rather than being taken by surprise. And it also, although from a Marxist perspective, one could say this, it showed the limits of Keynesianism, that there was a right. dialectic or a dynamic within Keynesianism that got it into a situation where it either had to move forward into a direction of um, uh, invoking the question of property, of private property and right. private capital accumulation, or um, in the neoliberal di direction of uh, recreating um, competitiveness and profitability by uh, hampering down on, on trade unions and, and That's right. And I think Keynesians never really accepted Keynes' own ambivalence. Keynes is clearly pro-capitalism, there's no doubt about that. And he believed, at least said he believed, that if his policies were put into place, capitalism would be like what was taught in the textbooks, an ideal social institution that provide justice and uh, equality and democracy and full employment. Well, whatever it did about the others, it surely did not provide full employment. And that is a, a, a difficulty that uh, Marxists and the left in general, because I, I, I don't see my book as a Marxist book, though anybody reading can recognize the influence of Marx, but also of Keynes, also of Ricardo in the theory of relative prices, Smith on exchange rates. I tried to put together a coherent framework but anyone on the left or coming from anti-neoclassic uh, economics would have to address the same questions. How much can you go within this system? What are its responses and limits? And that forces you to also think about, if you don't accept those limits, how do you go outside the system? Because if you think the system is infinitely flexible and can be adapted, then you don't have to pose that other question yeah. at all. Uh, I, I, and that's one of the things that came up in the, my presentation yesterday. Most of the questions were not about what I was saying. They were about the implication, how do you go beyond the system? And um, do you